Well, hello and good evening to those joining from the US. Good morning to our guests from Japan. It is a pleasure to invite you to our event, which is a partnership between the Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth and Southern Methodist University's Tower Center for Public Policy and International Affairs. My name is Paul Pass and I'm the Executive Director of the Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth. This event is one of many we have presented online since the spring of this year, and we are happy that you could join us during both the Japan America Society's 50th anniversary season and the Tower Center's 25th anniversary year. Before we proceed, I would like us to note that last week marked 75 years since the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Although we cannot change the past, we can look at the great strides made in US-Japan relations since World War II and the fact that now the two countries have one of the strongest bilateral alliances in the world. On a related note, we have all been affected by COVID-19 and we wish everyone safety and health during this uncertain time. In our current global situation, it is essential that we continue to communicate across borders and cultures, as well as within, within our own communities. Our program this evening is part of achieving this goal. Lastly, I wanted to go over some suggestions to maximize your experience. Please note that your cameras and microphones are off. If there are any technical issues, such as you are unable to hear the presenters, then please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions during the event, please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to ask questions early since we may not be able to address all of those during the program. And we will also try to integrate them into the conversation as much as we can. Please also note that this webinar will be recorded and we hope to upload this program to YouTube soon. Now to begin our program is Hiroki Takauchi, who will also serve as your moderator. In addition to being a great friend of the Japan America Society, he is Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the Tower Center Sun and Star Program on Japan and, South, Japan and East Asia at Southern Methodist University. Hiroki, please feel free to begin. Good afternoon, uh, good evening uh, for those from the United States and good morning uh, for those who are from Japan. Uh, I'm Hiroki Takeuchi. I'm an associate professor of political science and the director of the Sun Star Program on Japan East Asia in the SMU Tower Center. Welcome to the webinar series of Japan Metro Society Dallas Fort Worth and on behalf of uh, SMU Tower Center, I'm glad to, uh, uh, the, uh, grab, uh, I'm pleased with this opportunity to co-host this event with Japan Metro Society. I'm, I thank the team of the Japan Metro Society Dallas Fort Worth uh, with Paul, Madoka, and Ryan. Also, I thank uh, Bora Rachi from the SMU Tower Center for working to make this event happen. Also, on behalf, on behalf of the SMU Tower Center, uh, I, th I thank the support from Japan Airlines. Today, we are talking about Japanese government leadership and US-Japan relations under the COVID-19. We have two speakers, uh, to, uh, best, I would say the best speakers to talk about this topic. Well, before introducing our uh, two speakers, I'd like to uh, talk briefly about the current state of the COVID-19. United States for uh, up to today, uh, the death toll per population to, for uh, me, uh, 1 million people is 506. Um, some, other some countries have a larger number for death toll per uh, million, 1 million people. Uh, United Kingdom has, for example, 685. In the meantime, many of the East Asian countries have a good record of the death toll of um, uh, death toll per million, uh, one million people. Japan has eight, China three, South Korea six, and then Taiwan 0 0.3. So uh, it's very uh, it's very different. Um, situation between the United States and Japan. And in that sense, Japan has responded to uh, COVID-19 much better than um, United States so far. 
However, here is an interesting situation. In Japan, Prime Minister Abe's popularity has been going down since the COVID-19 spread. And actually, Japanese, uh, so uh, Prime Minister Abe is the only, almost the only uh, leader in the world whose popularity goes down since COVID-19 outbreak. South Korea and Taiwan, the leader's approval rate has risen since the COVID-19. And in Europe, for example, also uh, in Germany, uh, Chancellor Merkel's approval rate has also go been going up since the outbreak of the COVID-19. And then it reflects the German response, successful response to um, uh, COVID-19, whose the death toll per 1 million people is 120. So today we are talking about two aspects of the government's response to, uh, um, to the COVID-19 and international relations um, under the COVID-19. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Yosuke Sunahara. Uh, Dr. Sunahara is a professor of political science at Kobe University. He receives the uh, PhD from uh, University of Tokyo and he has taught uh, at the uh, City University of Osaka and Osaka University before joining uh, the faculty of Kobe University. For me, Sunahara-san is a very good friend of mine, as well as the author of one of the most interesting books I have read recently on Japanese politics. And then that is actually the book that then I have, I own this one. And it's titled Bunretsu Togo no Nihon Seiji, an English title is Party System Institutionalization in Japan. This is, I would say, the best book talking about the local importance of local governance in Japan. We often forget that in every country has local politics and then that is important. And then, so, um, so Sunohara-san is today talking about um, the lo central local relationship and then how like the central government and local governments respond differently to the COVID-19. Sometimes cooperating, sometimes conflicting. The second speaker is Mr. Ben Goldberg, a very good friend of mine. He is, uh, he is a Japan specialist in the State Department. And then for me, one thing that I say particularly is, and then very personal, uh, he, he has a very good sense of humor. And then also one more thing I add is uh, he has a very good language skill of Japanese. He speaks, he's a very good Japanese speaker. So please virtually join me for uh, welcoming two speakers, Dr. Sunahara and Mr. Goldberg, and Sunahara-san, uh, please start. Okay, uh, thank, thank you for having me today. It's a great pleasure for me to talk about the COVID-19 problem with the distinguished panelists and uh, participants in this webinar. I'd like to use a uh, slide Okay. Can I share it? Okay. Okay. Today I'd like to talk about a uh, focus on three topics uh, to talk about the COVID-19 crisis in Japan. The first one is the changes in political competition in Japan since 2000. It's kind of a background information to understand this time crisis. The second one is the main part of this talk, the governor's reaction to the COVID-19 crisis. And then I, I, I will move to the last one, the challenges for the near future, uh, which is really important questions in Japanese uh, you know, management to the COVID-19 crisis. Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> I'd like to start with the changes in political competition. This is a kind of background information 
to understand Japan's reaction to COVID-19. When I think of the current political situation, I emphasize the importance of the two reforms in the 1990s, electoral reform and decentralization reform. The first one got attention for two decades. LDP was changed after the reform and the prime minister got strong political power relative to other rivals, including the factional leaders who have a latent influence on political decisions. Many people expected that the reform would bring a two-party system in Japan, but after 2012, the opposition camp is very fragmented and small influence on the political process now. After all, we can find weak voices from the national level actors in this pandemic. Decentralization reform is sometimes ignored, but I think it's really significant when we think about Japanese politics. It changed the political structure at the local level. National politicians who are a force of local politicians reduced their influence on local political decisions after the decentralization reform. And the governors got substantial autonomy from the central government and some of them became a local boss. The structural change is significant, especially in urban areas, I think. We know Tokyo's Yuriko Koike, who is the first female governor in Tokyo Metropolitan Government, and Yoshimura Hirobumi, and, and Osaka Ishin no Kai, which is dominate in the uh, Osaka Prefecture Assembly. And it, the party also established national party called Japan Innovation Party. And also we can find influential leaders in Nagoya, Fukuoka, Chiba as well. So the punchline is these local leaders are a potential challenger to the LDP in the current time. Next, we turn to the governor's reaction to the crisis. The primary response to the crisis is based on medical treatment. Japan has a long tradition to address the spread of tuberculosis, TB, and public health centers called Hokenjo are developed to manage the spread of TB. This time, the governors basically used this system to manage the situation. The measure is characterized by extensive testing and quick isolation of patients. Japan's test capacity is usually said, uh, it's really limited, but some prefectures successfully implemented massive testing. Actually, the rural prefectures were doing well because they could react in the early stage when the confirmed cases are very small. Urban prefectures have similar measures, but the situation was much tough because the infection cases are rapidly increased. Even the public health centers could not catch all of them because they had not developed an effective data management system and collaboration among uh, public, centers, public health centers. Actually, the public health centers are fragmentedly established in the urban areas compared to the rural area because they are separately established in designated cities and special wards in Tokyo metropolitan government. Finally, the urban prefectures could not manage the situation as the rural ones did. Then they moved to the disaster manage mode, management mode in April. The last result was to request self-quarantine. The central government and local government asked the people to keep self-quarantine, but they could not offer sufficient compensation to business activities. They could not force people to stay home as well. Actually, even the people who had close contact with the infected might get out if they wanted. Though the government did not have sufficient and effective means, the politicians tried to show a strong attitude towards the, the pandemic. Conflicts occurred between the center and local government. 
Notably, the central government minister tended to take moderate and conservative responses to the crisis, while the governors insisted hard measures like lockdown should be considered. As well, in the recovery phase, the governors asked to lift the emergency declaration as quickly as possible. Of course, the central government could not ignore it. It was like a race for a revitalizing economy. Lastly, I'd like to point out some challenges for the future. The first one, the first important challenge is the situation in Okinawa, I think. Now the virus is spreading in Okinawa very rapidly. The virus comes from Tokyo and other urban areas. As well, a large cluster of found are found in the US military. Okinawa economy is strongly depending on the tourism and the US military demand, but they are a severe source of coronavirus transmission. Basically, Okinawa is a typical rural area in terms of the healthcare system. If the scale of infection is small, they could confine the coronavirus as the other rural prefectures did, but the virus influx and spread are likely to be far greater than the Okinawa medical capacity now. I'm afraid that the virus spread in Okinawa may bring a negative impact on public sentiment. It may get some serious issues like the US-based negotiation in Okinawa more complicated. I think both Japan and the US government should deal with the case very carefully. This is the first challenge. And second one is about the uh, managing, management of the disaster mode. When we return to the urban areas matter, the most significant challenge is how to manage the disastrous situation. We need to understand some leading indicators before turning into the disaster mode, like in April. Confirmed cases and positivity rates are kind of potential candidates, but they are not so reliable now. As well, before turning into the disaster mode, an agreement among political rivals is required. They are likely to claim credit, but integrated, integrated decision-making is essential. Leaders, needed, leaders need to think of utilizing scarce resources. Also, collaboration among municipalities is also required. In metropolitan area in Japan, there are a lot of municipalities despite of the prefecture border. National governor associations now asks the central government to declare the state of emergency for the municipality base. I'm wondering such a change, I think it means that the now state of emergency declaration is based on the prefecture level. So I'm wondering such a change may invite some serious fragmentation uh, to address uh, the COVID-19 crisis. The most important thing is the integration of data collection system through the public health center system. Now the prefecture governments are responsible for the coordination, but I'm not sure that they keep the responsibility after the change uh, to their municipality. Okay, this is, uh, that's it for my, uh, that's it for now, uh, my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sunahara-san, a uh, very um, insightful analysis of the uh, local uh, government's um, role uh, in the COVID-19. Uh, now, uh, the topic shifts slightly to uh, international level. So uh, US-Japan relations, and uh, well, something interesting, in, interesting is going on in US foreign policy, including US-Japan relations. And, but you know, in a, even a bigger, bigger picture would be also interesting. So, uh, so Ben, uh, could you talk about the implication of COVID-19 on US-Japan relations? Sure, first of all, I just want to thank the uh, Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth, Southern Methodist University, of course, Takeuchi Sensei and Sunahara Sensei, and uh, everyone else at the institutions who have helped this uh, seminar take place. 
unfortunately, I was unable to create a awesome slideshow like Sunohara Sensei. So you'll just have to uh, listen to me during my brief talk. I also appreciate Takeuchi Sensei's compliment that I speak Japanese really well. I think I've grown rusty over the last few months working from home a lot, but I have been able to practice some very interesting Japanese by watching Giri Haji, which I highly recommend. <laughs> uh, that was an unpaid endorsement. Um, anyway, back to my topic. So, obviously COVID has had a huge impact on US diplomacy and international relations, if only because travel and direct interaction is greatly limited. Um, that said, the US and Japan have been able to cooperate against this uh, terrible pandemic in a lot of different ways. Um, firstly, there's a weekly uh, telephone call between the Deputy Secretary of State, Stephen Began, with his counterparts from Japan and other major allied countries in the Asia Pacific, including Korea, uh, Australia, and others. And I think that's a good way to sort of coordinate national level response. Uh, I should add that Japan actually allowed Deputy Secretary Began and a small delegation to actually go in person to Japan a few weeks ago. Uh, that was the first direct high-level interaction in person, and it was logistically very difficult, but it also provided a really, really important opportunity for the two sides to talk directly about how to respond to the pandemic and how to also respond to other issues, such as, uh, you know, tensions with North Korea and other international issues. Um, I also want to acknowledge the other cooperation we've had with Japan on COVID in both public and private ways. Uh, for example, back in March when the pandemic first hit, Japanese Finance Minister Aso Taro and our Secretary of Treasury, Steve Mnuchin, had several telephone conversations to make sure that the global financial system would uh, be defended and that we would avoid as much fallout as possible from this pandemic, which is unfortunately causing a lot of economic havoc, uh, as well as, of course, the, um, the human cost in, in so many countries. Um, I also want to mention the massive assistance from Japanese companies to America. There have been an unbelievable amount of donations, uh, contributions, and assistance. Uh, I can give several examples. I know in Texas, uh, Toyota plays a large role. Uh, $500,000 to the United Way campaign and uh, many other issues to help produce ventilators and other medical equipment. There's a long list of Japanese companies who have done this. I can mention more if you want to ask more. So despite the COVID, I think the alliance cooperation to the U.S. and Japan, which is uh, such an important part of the foreign policy of both our countries, remains pretty strong. Uh, obviously, major exercises and interactions are not, are not, excuse me, are not possible, but we are doing a lot of virtual discussions, a lot of online um, negotiations and talks on a variety of different issues, ranging, as I said, from North Korea to alliance issues, to um, military exercises, to uh, various other discussions. So I wanna emphasize that the alliance is still strong and we are still uh, heavily involved with Japan in both its defense and trying to maintain uh, a stable and peaceful Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and part of that, of course, is the massive economic cooperation with Japan. As you all know, uh, uh, last year, excuse me, on January 1st of this year, we signed the U.S.-Japan trade agreement, a major trade deal with Japan uh, that reduces tariffs on a major amount of U.S. agricultural exports and also uh, digital trade that has a lot of high-level provisions to protect ongoing trade and other economic interaction. Uh, due to COVID, of course, phase two of that U.S. trade deal has not yet begun, but we are hoping to begin it soon so that we can further expand economic cooperation between our two nations. 
And I want to add that economic cooperation is not just limited to direct trade, it's also extended to several other areas. We have a number of ongoing bilateral programs with Japan, such as the U.S.-Japan Economic Partnership, the U.S.-Japan Digital Economy Partnership, and also the U.S.-Japan, um, excuse me, I want to get the acronym right. The U.N. Um, Mekong Power Partnership, which helps promote power generation and energy uh, usage and development in the Southeast Asia region. That's a very important part of our cooperation, among many others. And um, I should also segue here a little bit to a, deep, a deeper form of economic diplomacy, which is uh, the U.S.'s Clean Path Initiatives, which are designed to maintain a free and fair and open system of advanced technology. We have a large number of Clean Path Initiatives. Perhaps most important is 5G, where we're working closely with Japan, despite the COVID pandemic, to make sure that uh, the digital economy and the new 5G networks that are underway in many parts of the world are free, fair, and open for economic competition and open use. All these things are just mentions. We can go into more detail in the Q&A if you like. And um, finally, I just want to say really quickly that uh, obviously there is news today. Uh, politics is always part of the alliance. And uh, as uh, Professor Sunahara said, Prime Minister Abe is facing some tensions both in Tokyo and with local leaders. Uh, we have our election coming up in November here in the United States. Uh, so politics plays a role in both countries, of course, in both countries' diplomacy and foreign relations. But I do think that there is a deep, strong, broad, and very, very, very um, powerful interest in both the U.S. and Japan to maintain a strong alliance, to maintain close economic relations, and maintain close cooperation against the pandemic. So I uh, should make sure I make that clear. I should also add as an aside, given Sunahara Sensei's excellent comments on local relations, that despite the COVID pandemic, we also have not only our embassy in Tokyo, but also our consulates in various parts of Japan, working very strongly to increase U.S.-Japan interaction and U.S.-Japan relations. Uh, just to make sure we know, we have consulates in Sapporo, Osaka, Kobe, um, Nagoya, Naha, and also Fukuoka. And every, all of our colleagues at the State Department, both in Tokyo and in those cities, are working hard to keep this relationship strong and uh, deepen it even further as we move forward. So uh, I think I've gone a little bit over my time. I'll end there and I look forward to an active Q&A. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, I would like to start a uh, uh, question, but uh, uh, Q&A, uh, some questions are already in from the uh, audience and I will take it and try to take as much as possible. Uh, trying to mix it with, uh, um, with uh, uh, the question that I have had. So uh, I should start with starting with let's start with uh, Ben uh, about U.S.-Japan relations. Um, my observation is the U.S. and Japan U.S.-Japan alliance is I would say the most um, active and uh, most I would say successful bilateral um, alliance uh, in the world. And um, having said that the current type of communication or uh, cooperation, as long as we see uh, publicly, is very uh, weak, I think. I do not hear much about it. Uh, you mentioned about some like of cooperative activities between the US and Japan. Um, however, I thought we would hear more uh, about the cooperation between the United States and Japan the most important alliance in the world uh, for, um, uh, for uh, wrestling with pandemic. Don't you think so, number one? And then like, uh, if 
it is the case, why is that? Is it just because like um, President Trump is not so, uh, does not think like an alliance is so important and at, at least like uh, superficially, as long as uh, what he says, like uh, sometimes he doubts the, the value of alliance, et cetera, et cetera. Or is there anything like a fundamental uh, issue here? Uh, well, that's a very good and very <laughs> tough question. Uh, you was expressed or uh, my own, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the United States government or the State Department. I think that Takeuchi Sensei, what you're saying is, is accurate in a sense, but I think that during this pandemic, all countries have sort of turned inward and are focusing on their own domestic problems and issues to an extent. And I think there's not as much coverage as international initiatives and international cooperation that frankly are not of immediate use if you've just lost your job or if your factory is closed. Um, so, you know, could there be more cooperation between the US and Japan? Absolutely, 100%, there could always be more. Uh, but I do think that both the US government and the Japanese government are in constant close touch about a variety of issues. And, um, even, even such issues as um, discussing, uh, I'm trying to find the exact note. Um, I mean, back in March, the US government and Japan's uh, health ministry were in talks about comparative effects of remdesivir, the drug that was initially uh, used to treat patients on the Diamond Princess cruise ship in February. There's a lot of talk about cooperation, as I mentioned, with private Japanese companies and how to create more ventilators and create more equipment here in America to help patients. And, um, you know, I, I think there is a lot of interaction going on. That said, I mean, as you know, the, the current U.S. government is a little more unilateral than previous governments. So to an extent, what you're saying maybe is true, but I would say it's a scale rather than a yes or a no. I'll just stop there. Okay, um, my, a question to uh, Tsunahara-san. Um, so I, I combine my question to a question from Dr. Len Chopa, um, professor at uh, University of Virginia. Um, so uh, I've, can, could you talk a little bit more about how um, local governments and then also other institutions um, respond to uh, COVID-19 in Japan? Um, particularly, I, what I have in mind is uh, uh, in Japanese called Hokenjo. That's actually the health center. Uh, it's a public health center, which actually, um, that is one thing that uh, Japan has, but the United States doesn't have. And then in my understanding, uh, Hokenjo Health Center plays a lot of uh, roles, like, uh, especially um, like the testing. Uh, sometimes it's a testing site, and then also um, uh, they are the major player for um, uh, contact tracing, right? So, um, so could you talk a little bit about like how Hokkienjo Health Center is working in Japan for COVID-19? And, um, and then like uh, uh, Len, Len Shoppa, um, our friends and teacher, <laughs> um, and he actually asked the question of, uh, uh, so uh, he wants to, he wants you to talk about a little bit about how Japan's response to COVID has been shaped by its heavy reliance on volunteers at the neighborhood and municipal level for public health monitoring and outreach. So he knows that in some of some other countries, the public health workforce is composed almost entirely of government employees. So he wonders if this difference is playing the role. So uh, could you talk a little bit about more at the grassroots level activities? Okay, thank you for the question. 
Uh, at first, uh, the question from Professor Takeuchi about the public health center system. I just mentioned uh, something about the public health center in my talk. But I said, uh, I think the public health center is essential, especially in the uh, rural prefectures uh, response to the uh, COVID-19 crisis. <clears throat> because uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, public health center systems, but you know, in urban areas, the public health center system is really kind of fragmented because uh, some designated cities and some special world have its own public health center system. But in a rural area, the health center is integrated to the governor. And for example, the Wakayama prefecture governor said uh, he leads uh, his uh, kind of uh, public health center in his jurisdiction and uh, he directed to the public health center to implement a massive testing and uh, make a quick isolation. And I think uh, this kind of rural urban difference is very important when we think about the COVID-19 crisis uh, in Japan. And uh, as I said, in urban area, uh, the government has a really you know, limited means to address the COVID-19 crisis. But in, especially in rural area, the pub public health center has a uh, kind of coercion uh, worship power to you know <clears throat> to prevent their infection because then uh, the public health center was established uh, primarily for the uh, addressing TB you know so they have their you know kind of strong version to keep their patients stay home or stay in their some uh, facilities uh, to prevent their spreading uh, TB infection. Like TB, they, they, try, they used this kind of coercive power in, in case of COVID-19. But in urban area, it's really difficult to use this kind of coercive power because the public health center is so limited and fragmented. And also the people can move very broadly in the urban areas. And uh, Professor, Professor Chopard's comment is very important to think about the situation in urban areas. Because of the situation, as I mentioned, there are the only way to make use by urban area, uh, urban prefecture is to request uh, people to stay home. <laughs> it's just a self quarantine. And uh, it's the voluntary activity, kind of inactivity, is very important to calm the situation. And <clears throat> I think, but, but in this case, I think that more voluntary activity is uh, required. For example, I'd like to share a slide. Uh, on Twitter, uh, which is, you know, the posted by the uh, public health center leader in Tokyo area. Uh, this one, he mentioned uh, he is providing a relief supply to the people who are staying home and who have uh, you know, minor uh, symptoms. Of course, uh, the medical capacity is so limited. So some minor, uh, some people with a minor symptom should be staying at home, and they need some relief supplies from the government or from the uh, community. So this time, the public health center try to, you know, move uh, toward these kind of people, and then uh, they just try to supply these kind of relief sets, and then uh, that kind of, you know, new movement is really important to tackle against the next wave of uh, COVID-19, I think. That's it. Thanks. Um, one more question to Sunahara-san, and then um, quite different question. And then like, also uh, maybe like, uh, Ben may uh, also um, uh, jump in, want to jump in to uh, this, answering this question. So, um, our uh, Tower Center forum member, Ray Termini, asked, um, in July, the New York Times published an article that a coronavirus outbreak at US bases in Okinawa caused the tensions between the military and the local government. What is the current status? I think the, you know, the tension between uh, US base, US military and the Okinawa government was uh, yeah, serious, but recently, uh, there are an, another incident that happened in Okinawa that is caused by the uh, travel campaign of Japanese government. So 
they are now really criticize their new travel campaign. But at the same time, they are depending on the tourist. The tourist industry is really important, essential in Okinawa prefecture. So it's hard to criticize all, but uh, actually they are, you know, feeling fear uh, to have an infection. And so, you know, this kind of, I, I, I'd say there are two kind of, two sources of uh, tension between Okinawa government and US military and then uh, Okinawa government and Tokyo central government. Uh, at first, the te first tension, uh, Okinawa government and the uh, US military base was serious, but recently the situation moved uh, to the next step. And the uh, central government, the conflict between central, central government and Okinawa government is much more serious now, I think. Ben, do you want to jump in? I'll just say that it, it is a serious issue, and I think I don't have up to date numbers. I believe it's over a uh, hundred at least uh, US service members or their families have been diagnosed as positive at our facilities in Okinawa. But, you know, I think Sunahara Sensei and you and many others know well that tensions between the US bases in Okinawa and the local government have been very have existed for decades and um, will probably keep existing. And I frankly think that this latest COVID-19 outbreak is uh, just one more thing that, that I fear will, will worsen those tensions. I will say that US forces Japan in Okinawa have at least tried very hard to be transparent, be honest, to make sure that anyone who is diagnosed as positive stays uh, isolated, to try to work as much as possible with not just the local government in Naha, but even the local city and, and, and um, smaller governments, try to trace contacts. And it's a very difficult situation, but you know, to be completely honest, if the United States can't completely control the outbreak here in America, it's hard for us to control it on our facilities abroad as well. And uh, I, I just, uh, it, is, it is tragic. I will say that Sunahara Sensei has a very good point that obviously the tensions are also very deep between the Okinawa prefectural government and the central government in Tokyo, also on a range of, of many issues. Okay. Um, and one, uh, another question is, uh, um, uh, to probably Snahara san, uh, san um, So, a uh, question from Erin Messick. Uh, did the virus cause anti foreigner, anti immigrant sentiment in Japan? Unfortunately, it was something we saw in the United States. Yes, it's a really difficult question, but I, I'm afraid that the uh, anti foreigner or anti travel -travel sentiment uh, in Japan because Actually, I, I'm not watching so long hours, but uh, uh, people say that uh, the TV program, like, you know, so-called wide show in Japan, is kind of, you know, talking much about uh, uh, this kind of phenomena. I mean, the, some people from Tokyo uh, travel to Okinawa and they get infected or you know, spread a virus or something. So this kind of, you know, broadcasting is sometimes cause their uh, tension uh, between the central government or central area and local area. And also their uh, anti-foreigner uh, or anti-traveler sentiment. Okay, thank you. Um, ben, uh, do you want to jump in or comment? Okay. Um, question to... Um, Snahara san, um, quite different. Um, I think a difficult one. <laughs> um, from uh, Eve Tivergian, from uh, of um, professor at the University of British Columbia. Um, so, uh, so two questions. Uh, but uh, let let's say that the uh, to pick up the first one. Um, so compared to Taiwan and Korea, Japan seems to have done a few things wrong. No active contact tracing. Uh, late start with an extensive testing, 
uh, loose uh, quarantine rules. And yet the numbers are pretty close to uh, leading nations. Um, so uh, what explains Japan's good performance in the end? Is it all about the use of masks? And then I'd like to uh, add one more question. Um, and then why is Abe so unpopular? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, question. thank you, Eve. Um, the first one is, uh, I, I think I, I'd, I'd like to emphasize two points uh, about Eve's question. The first one is, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, we should understand the difference between the urban area and rural area. The, as I said, the rural area, in rural area, the prefecture government uh, tried to implement it, in try to implement uh, massive testing and uh, quick isolation. And this is like, a, you know, <laughs> um, as I, I, I'd say this is like a Vietnam or some other countries, uh, which is considered to be successful. But in urban area, it is really difficult to implement this kind of testing because of their uh, testing capacity and some of the reasons, including their political competition between the urban and uh, urban government and central government. But the, the next point I'd like to emphasize is there, I, I think uh, the Japanese people feeling, uh, I mean, their, the fear to the virus is really important. I think uh, it, it's really strange and really interesting, but in this month, in August, uh, at, at the top of August, we found a large, huge increase in the confirmed, num confirmed cases uh, all over Japan. But in this week, we are watching the you know, decreasing number of the infection. I think it, it's uh, one of the reasons is uh, the fear to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic or infection uh, of the people is, you know, now changing a bit situation a little bit. But of, of course the fear is very important, but at the same time, uh, this kind of fear may, you know, discourage the economic activity. And that's the, you know, next important problem uh, when we think about the uh, COVID-19 crisis. And the last one, Takeuchi Sensei's comment, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I also have two points. And the first one is a really, you know, upland thing. <laughs> the Prime Minister sometimes make a speech, a public speech about the COVID-19, but the number is so limited. <laughs> and people do not uh, watch the Prime Minister speaking. You know, so kind of rally round flag effect is very small in Japan, I think. And also the second point, is the uh, prime minister is in a competition uh, among the political leaders, including local governors. So sometimes uh, I, I think Governor Koike is really doing well <laughs> compared to the prime minister. So she came later than the <laughs> central government action. So actually she is waiting for the government, central government action and uh, she reacts to the central government. She sometimes criticizes the central government and then uh, try to show her bigger than her yeah, reality. So that's the one reason why the Abe, Prime Minister Abe is doing bad, looking bad in this pandemic. Yeah, I have, we received a question from uh, Erin Messick and Len Shop uh, for uh, a similar question. So, uh, about the, uh, the current kind of travel ban uh, at both sides, right, kind of. <clears throat> so um, one question is uh, when do you think the Japan will open up to American tourist travel again? And then this is actually a kind of mutual uh, thing. So um, when like, you know, this, uh, how to like uh, uh, loosen uh, the restriction um, uh, will, uh, you know, start like uh, the discussion uh, and then like um, another uh, specific uh, question uh, is, uh, so uh, this is actually a question to Ben uh, from Len. Um, so would you like to com comment on how US-Japan cooperation has been affected by the Japanese government's decision to block 
permanent residents who had traveled abroad from returning to Japan. We read that some long-term residents are feeling alienated after investing time and effort in building a life in Japan. And at a time when foreign businesses based in Hong Kong are looking for a new possible base in Asia, this policy seems self-defeating for positioning Japan for international economic cooperation and leadership. So uh, that's quite specific. So um, let's start with the Ben. Could you answer that question? And then I start going back to Sunahara-san for the Japanese policy of uh, uh, lifting the travel ban. Well, I, I can just say that as for tourism, I mean, I think global tourism has taken a huge hit and I frankly have no idea when it will open again. Uh, I know that Japan has pretty strict restrictions, even on diplomatic uh, staff to have a 14 day quarantine upon arrival. So in terms of travel and tourism, I, I think that's gonna stay uh, pretty low for some time. Len's question is very specific and very good. And I can't really answer it. Obviously, Japan is an independent sovereign country and Japan makes its own decisions uh, regarding who it allows in and who it allows out. We have received many, many complaints from a wide variety of US citizens who are permanent residents in Japan and they are not pleased with this policy. And we have brought it up with the Japanese at the highest level. And uh, Japan has said they will make some humanitarian exceptions. Uh, but the process to get that exception is very bureaucratic and very limited. And so I think that as Len put it, and you did as well, many US citizens in Japan are somewhat frustrated. But uh, there's only so much we at the State Department can do directly to help them. Because in the final analysis, you know, just like our country, countries control their own borders. So we can't force them to do this. All I can say is that our interlocutors at the Foreign Ministry have said that they will start to offer more exceptions and more exemptions so that hopefully this will lessen in intensity. Uh, the problem is that relating to an earlier question, uh, there has been some spread of COVID from foreign citizens entering into Japan. I don't think Japan has reacted in a xenophobic or anti-foreigner way, but it's not just the US. There have been spread from Brazilian entry. There's been spread from Pakistani entry. And uh, I just unfortunately think that as long as this pandemic continues, international travel is gonna be limited and impacted. And, and, uh, and I don't really have a better answer than that. Maybe Sonara Sensei does. Okay, uh, Sonara san Okay, so of course I think uh, the Japan, Japanese government should already open the borders uh, because the tourist industry is one of the most important industry in current Japan. But the condition is really, you know, difficult. So, of course, I think it's better if the Japanese government uh, prepare some tracing system or uh, kind of the, uh, you know, the preparation system like uh, Taiwan and the uh, South Korea. And also the vaccination is required. But uh, this kind of, you know, environment is, uh, you know, kind of visual thinking. So we should think about the you know, other way uh, to reopen their uh, borders. But um, I think the important thing we sh should consider is uh, to, you know, to travel, uh, to move uh, across the different levels of COVID-19. In Japan, as I said uh, in Okinawa, um, the infect infection level in Tokyo is so high and Okinawa, the level in in, of Okinawa was low uh, in, before the August, but the people from uh, people moved from Tokyo to Okinawa, and the Okinawa the infection was, you know, rapidly spread. So this same kind of uh, situation may occur if the Japanese government reopened the border. So I think uh, it's kind of you know first step, but we need to think about the to you know move across the different levels of the infection. And uh, we actually, I don't, I don't have <laughs> any ideas about the uh, good way to solve this problem, but uh, uh, there we, 
uh, the first step is we should uh, confirm that kind of we have a different levels or uh, different situations in, in a region, in each region. And then that's the first step to think about the reopening border. And then one more thing, like I'd like to uh, uh, related to that, like I'd like uh, Sunahara san to answer is uh, so one of the re you know reasons um, that you know uh, Japanese uh, government, especially, really like uh, is concerned with uh, uh, when to uh, lift travel restrictions is uh, uh, Japan will host the Tokyo Olympics that is postponed to next year. So uh, if like uh, things do not uh, settle and then the travel restrictions cannot uh, be lifted, uh, then like, uh, that will affect um, the, um, you know, uh, that will affect the, uh, whether uh, Japan can host the Tokyo Olympics uh, next year. Um, so uh, David Kam and some other actually asked the question of um, how is the Japanese government planning to handle all of this, like uh, possible cancellation of Tokyo Summer Olympics, and uh, also, you know, how to like uh, lift, uh, um, loosen the travel restrictions, etc. Uh, actually, I want to know, I want to know that, <laughs> but uh, I think that key point is uh, the fear, the public fear to the coronavirus, uh, because uh, as, as you know that there. Prime Minister Abe is now in the kind of last phase of his tenure, and the the, the you know duration uh, the tenure will be expired in uh, 2021. So he is now thinking about the dissolution of the parliament. So if he and his staff cannot handle the public fear, the uh, public fear to the COVID-19, he may easily lose. Uh, his government and his power. So that's the most important point uh, to the Prime Minister Abe and the LDP. So of course they want to you know, uh, host the Tokyo Olympic Games in the next year, but uh, the election is also important uh, for them. So when I, I, it's, of course it's my personal opinion, but when they think about their uh, election I think it's so difficult uh, to host the Tokyo Olympic Games. Anything uh, you want to add, Ben? I can tell you sincerely that the, we 100% want Japan to host the Olympic Games. We would prefer to have the Olympic Games go forward. But I, I have to say that at this point, it seems like it will be very difficult, as Sunahara Sensei said, even to hold it next year, both politically, economically, and logistically. And um, in terms of the economy, I mean, Japan has passed two massive stimulus packages. I think Tokyo is trying to address the economic disaster caused by this pandemic. And uh, maybe not in the best ways, we can debate that, but definitely at least Tokyo has tried to do some things to try to improve the economic situation, which, which is, I mean, which is bad everywhere. It's not just Japan, obviously. Well, um, and then uh, we are uh, going toward the end of the, uh, to, uh, of the session and then um, asking uh, probably one more question. And then this is, I try to combine a few big questions into even bigger question. Um, so that is actually uh, coming from, uh, the first one coming from uh, my former student, Ferus Adams. So, uh, so he is interested in like, uh, um, so um, East Asian countries are doing better. Is it because that they learned the lesson from um, the experience of SARS uh, in almost um, two decades ago? Um, and the secondly, um, do you think, that, so, um, so do you think that you know, US is not doing well because uh, of its lack of a major pandemic in nearly a century, and um, and then like and I'd like to add uh, add this um, question to uh, that question. That is, uh, if the U.S. should learn something 
uh, from what East Asian countries' governments are doing, like the Japanese government, South Korean governments, or Taiwanese government. Uh, if U.S. should learn something from uh, those countries, uh, what should U.S. learn? And then I, I would like to um, um, also add this question from, uh, this is actually from Eve, Eve's second question. Uh, that is, uh, um, so um, local governments, local leaders are doing a good job, especially compared with uh, Professor, uh, Prime Minister Abe. Uh, and then uh, local governors are more popular. Um, so, uh, Snahara-san, uh, what is your ranking of the governors? So how would, uh, so uh, can we rank urban governors in the end? And uh, what is the best, what are the best practices that the U.S. should learn uh, from the uh, performance of um, urban governors in Japan? So, um, who wants to start? Um, maybe Ben, could you start? Um, well, that's a very interesting point. We haven't had a very, very serious pandemic for over a hundred years. So the point that the US hasn't had experience that many East Asian countries did have with SARS is a valid one. Um, I know Sunahara Sensei is an expert on local government relations with the central government. So maybe I would just say that the US federal system where there are many different states and many different school systems and so many different uh, jurisdictions making decisions on how best to respond to this overwhelming crisis might be part of our problem. But that's purely my opinion. I'm no epidemiologist and I have no idea how we, would, how we could have addressed this better. Maybe I can only say that, um, I mean, if you're looking globally, it does seem like on the whole, countries in East Asia have responded better. Though some doctors argue that's because the strains of COVID in that region are less strong than the strains in Europe and at least some of America. So I honestly don't know. Snahara-san. Okay, so difficult question. Well, uh, the first one, it, it not to my, uh, not to me, but uh, uh, Japan has also, you know, also no, no major pandemic uh, after the uh, World War II, I think, uh, except for the uh, TB. But actually, TB was not a kind of nationwide pandemic. So it's really, you know, local level uh, infection, infection disease. So, so that the local uh, public health center system has a kind of method, the accumulated method to, to uh, response to their uh, kind of infectious diseases. And uh, this, in this coronavirus pandemic, the rural area and local, uh, local public center can manage the situation as they did for TB. So the, I think that's the, my first line. And then, so it's really difficult to compare the urban governors. I, so because I think it's kind of unfair uh, question to the <laughs> urban governors because then they don't have enough uh, sufficient measures to tackle against this kind of disease. So if I raise their good governors, uh, the Chiba City uh, and the Fukuoka City mayor was really good uh, because they are doing, you know, supply, uh, providing some uh, supplies to people or and, uh, they spread the important information to the uh, people and they supported their medical systems or something. So they're doing well, but Chiba and uh, Fukuoka is kind of limited area, and I think they can manage their jurisdiction uh, much easier than the Tokyo and Osaka governors. But when we think about the Tokyo and Osaka, they are, you know, do, they kind of imp their implementation is really difficult because their jurisdiction is limited to Tokyo metropolitan government or Osaka area, but they are dealing with, uh, you know, large larger area than Tokyo and Osaka. So they need to coordinate with the uh, Hyogo prefecture or Kanagawa prefecture governors and uh, small municipalities or something. So it's really hard. And uh, some, and also they are doing a kind of race uh, among political leaders. So 
it's a, I think it's really difficult for me to uh, discern the good practice and the bad practice, but uh, they are, you know, kind of, kind of they, are, they were moving, uh, incentivized by the kind of political institution. And uh, um, of course, sometimes it may really bad uh, consequences. Uh, when, for example, when we think about the uh, Osaka governor's uh, recent, you know, claim about the uh, uh, new medical uh, matters, uh, maybe you, some of you do not, do not know about that, but uh, sometimes the Osaka governors, um, you know, mislead uh, the people by using their kind of uh, not appropriate expert opinion. So that uh, I think really serious matter uh, in urban areas, uh, governors uh, management to the COVID crisis. But then, as I said, then it's really hard to judge uh, which is a bad, bad and which is good in this stage. Actually, I, let me uh, briefly uh, add um, to the, um, the discussion about you know, what um, is learned from SARS. Um, the Taiwan is actually an interesting case where uh, Taiwan really learned from SARS. Uh, during SARS in 2003, um, Taiwan, has had, Taiwan had a 33 deaths. So 33 people uh, died. This time, only seven people have, been, have died uh, by uh, COVID-19. So, uh, and then like, uh, since 2003, uh, they, ha uh, they founded the Taiwanese version of CDC. So, uh, so they really like uh, learned from SARS and then they actually modeled the US institutions. Um, unfortunately, it seems that the United States, uh, the Trump administration has undermined the uh, institutions that the US originally had. Uh, and then uh, that affects negatively uh, the response uh, to the, uh, the COVID-19. So that's actually one thing, one, um, one, uh, one thing I'd like to add. And then definitely actually Asian countries, some of the Asian countries, especially Taiwan, and then also South Korea. South Korea, it's not just SARS in 2003, but also later they were hit by uh, Mars. And uh, so that actually experience was helpful for the government to respond to COVID-19. So uh, that's actually the current um, situation. So uh, this issue uh, is a very big issue and it's ongoing issue. Uh, so uh, still like so, uh, quite a few questions are left unanswered, but actually time is, has come up. So uh, I will now pass, um, to, uh, pass this to Paul. Paul. Great. Well, um, thank you so much, Hiroki. And uh, thank you to our distinguished panelists and moderator for their time and expertise. We would also like to express our gratitude to everyone who attended the program and for your eagerness to explore U.S.-Japan relations and domestic Japanese politics. We apologize that we can't get to all your questions, but if you have anything specific you would like to know, please send to info at jasdfw.org. Again, that's info at jasdfw.org. Just give me a moment. I'm going to share some upcoming programs. I'm going to share the screen. You can see on the screen, we have a program coming up next week. This will be focusing on Japanese health and wellness. We will have a noted medical expert with us that evening, as well as a representative from Ituan, North America. Uh, in just two weeks, we'll have a program in partnership with the Japan America Society of Georgia, focusing on air travel. So this will look at both what is happening currently and uh, what we can expect maybe in the near future. And um, as you can see, the speakers will include um, representative from Atlanta International Airport, as well as Japan Airlines and Delta Airlines. Coming up in just a few weeks will be the first ever virtual Otsukimi celebration from the Japan American Society of Dallas-Fort Worth. And this will include a shamisen performance. We will also have uh, demonstrations of dango making, which is very traditional during Otsukimi, and we will have um, uh, presentations or performances from Sendai, uh, 
Uh, Sendai is the uh, international friendship city with Dallas. Additionally, we are working on a program in, um, let's give me one moment to stop the share. Um, we are also working on a program, um, it's on our website now and we'll open registration soon. This is a program mid-September focusing on the effect of anime and Japanese pop culture on the rest of the world. Please check www.jasdfw.org and www.smu.edu slash tower center for regular updates as we both schedule more programs throughout the summer and into the fall. If any of you are wondering about the, the links to those organizations, um, there is some information in the chat box. And so there's a hyperlink that you can click on. This concludes the program. Thank you for attending and have a wonderful rest of the evening for our US attendees and a great rest of the day for those in Japan. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Hiroki, Sonohara Sensei, Ben. Have a great rest of the day and thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone. Stay safe.